Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so delightful to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, there's some pad folios on this side. If, if um, for those of you who are just walking in now, we have some lovely pad folios for you. Um, so if, if we run out, feel free to stop by our table in the exhibit hall and we'll give you one. So um, we're here to talk about staffing, tools for recruiting, retaining and engaging staff. My name is Denise Sayer and I am the innovator of the ECE Shared Resources Platform. I've been doing this work for almost 15 years. Actually, next year will be our 15th year in business. Uh, we're much, we're part of a much larger organization that supports independent and locally owned businesses in a variety of industries, but primarily, of all things, floor covering. Um, my background is not in floor covering, it's in organizational management. And I come here with, actually it was a quality auditor for an international aerospace system. And how did I get into childcare? It's kind of interesting and different uh, and circuitous route, but we started working with nonprofits and trying to help them find ways to scale and to be more sustainable. And we were building this platform of business resources and support. So interestingly, childcare was the first group that said, we want what you're doing. If you build it, we'll be your first customers. And that was Colorado and they, are still our customers today. But in, that's how we got into childcare. I was just so interested in it that I decided to leave the position that I was um, in, which was Director of Strategic Initiatives, and to become the Vice President of ECE Shared Resources and CCA for Social Good. So, um, so that's how I got to be where I am today. And this is my colleague, Celissa, and she'll introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Celissa Hoyt and I've actually been in the early childhood field since the early 80s, so a little bit dating myself. Um, I got into the field because I was passionate about working with children in the classroom and that's actually what I thought I would do for my entire career. When I became a director, my passion sort of evolved to be focused on how do we incre increase quality and how do we improve compensation because teachers, high quality teachers are obviously at the core of quality. And so that was sort of my passion and my drive. And, um, and I was involved, I was one of the founding directors of a shared service initiative in New Hampshire. That was in about 2008, 2009. And I actually met Denise when they were, um, when the company was thinking about what nonprofit sector to go in. And in New Hampshire, we were saying, please, please pick us. It took <laughs> us longer in New Hampshire to raise the funds to bring the platform to our state, but we did. Did. And, um, and then I actually worked for 10 years in the shared service sort of um, industry, helping childcare programs throughout the state of New Hampshire take advantage of the platform, the resources that were there, the cost savings. I worked for the nonprofit that actually sponsors the platform in the state of New Hampshire. So, and one more thing I'll just say about Denise, when I met her, she was definitely learning the early childhood field. Now, 15 late, years later, she talks like someone who's actually worked in a program, managed a program, even though she hasn't, she knows the field really, really well. So Kate, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Kate Byrne, I'm from, can everyone hear me? Uh, I'm from Central Florida. Um, I have a, uh, my, my background is primarily business. So I've been in the childcare industry just for about the past four years. Um, I, uh, I worked with the Early Learning Coalition in Orange County, Florida, as the uh, head of the Business Institute for Early Learning Entrepreneurs, and, um, and Raquel took my place doing that. Um, but I've also, since I left there, I've been working with Opportunities Exchange uh, as a consultant, as part of the staff. And then after working with uh, OPEX for the last couple of years, I decided to write a business plan and launch a shared services alliance in Central Florida. So that um, this time last year, I was writing that business plan and launched our pilot program in the fall of 2021. Uh, so part of what I'm going to be talking about today is um, how our Shared Services Alliance, ELSA, Early Learning Shared Services Alliance, um, does as much as it can to um, promote um, hiring, uh, solving the staffing issues for um, our clients, um, and equitable pay. 
Good morning, everyone. Raquel Perez. I am a business um, child care coach um, and just recently actually joined the ELSA organization. Um, my background is workforce development, um, organizational management, but I'm an entrepreneur myself. So a lot of the pain and aches that these business owners, um, leaders are experiencing, I experience it as an entrepreneur as well. I'm excited that I've been able to be in this industry for the past three years. My workforce development background does help me really help these um, providers focus on overcoming those challenges. So I'm excited about you know the, the topic that's gonna be discussed today and um, it's gonna be a amazing experience today and you're gonna walk away with some great, great tips. Thank you, Raquel. So as you can see, we have quite a panel and quite a lot of experience in both the fields, but also in business. And I think you know early childhood educators is the career that um, the folks that we're talking about today started in and maybe is their background in, but they're running businesses. And one of the hardest things to do is this human resource side of it. And right now it's even way more challenging than it ever has been. So um, let me advance the slide here. There we go. I love this slide because if you're, you're looking at it, you see that one dragonfly real up close and personal, and you see the other one a little further away. And we're gonna be looking at this topic through two different lenses, both at a micro level and at a macro level. So the micro level work is the work that Raquel and Kate are doing in Central Florida. And the work that we do is that macro level work across all of the states where we know the needs are so similar and we can um, provide resources to help them. But let's take a look at the situation. If you, you, know, you look at what we're dealing with, recruitment is a challenge. Um, unemployment is at an all time low. And this is, you know, unfortunately, it is not just facing the early care and education workforce. It is facing any kind of service industry, education included, in which there is that close one-on-one -on -one personal contact. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with that. We know there are factors that were contributing to this in the past, and that was um, the baby boomers were aging out of the workforce. Um, there still was a great deal of them in the workforce, but now we're talking about the great resignation. And what happened is it accelerated the boomers' decision to leave the workforce. Um, and although there are still some in the workforce, myself included, um, it, there's, you know, there's a challenge there. And so what was happening millennials who are kind of the next gen y they were the next ones that are actually coming up the up the ranks they were the lead teachers and the teachers are the ones that had the most skills and they're taking those leadership roles now and now we still have that continual problem of backfilling um, work with uh, kids in the classroom right with teachers so we have we have the silver tsunami, which is the baby, baby boomers aging out. We have the great resignation. Now we have something according to Indeed called the great reshuffle. I don't know if you heard about this, but what the great reshuffle is, people are just deciding, I want to try something else. I want to leave the fields that I'm in. I may be passionate about it, but you know what? Why not? Life is too precious, and the pandemic has really taught us a lot about how precious life is, that they're making these decisions to change career fields, to go back to school, or maybe to even start their own new business. And you couple that, layer it on top with the wage pressure, right? And who knew that places like Target and Home Depot and fast food are paying more than early childhood educated teachers are making. And if you're making a decision between, you know, a dollar or two extra an hour and you're, you know, have to cover the costs for running your home and caring for your family, you're going to make the, the, the dollars and cents decision, even though your passion may not be there. So we're dealing with all of that. 
we're dealing with generational differences. We have the millennials who are coming into being more of the leaders in the field. They have values that are really important to them, like work-life balance, flexibility, um, and even diversity practices. And then now you add on top of that Gen X, and those um, those folks are a little bit um, a little bit older, but still they're, they're resourceful people. They really balance flexibility, um, fulfillment, diversity, and they're very ethnically diverse. So as as an industry and as a business, a business, what we're seeing is that. Um, businesses have to adjust their values and their culture. And if they're not doing it, they're missing out on this important part that really causes not only the recruitment, the retention and engagement of the staff. So that's what we're looking at today. And we're deciding from um, a meaningful way, how can we have impact? So we're going to talk real specifically about a model that's having true impact in Central Florida. It is very, you know, one inch wide, one mile deep, but tremendously important. And that's really what a shared services alliance can do. And then we'll show you how we support their work. And they'll actually talk about that too. Um, and we'll show you some of the other things that we're doing to get to that other piece, which is to adjust corporate culture and values and to really work on that, bringing humanity to, um, you know, to the, the HR and soft skills side of running an early childhood business. All righty, so here we are. So I just wanted to let you know, um, Denise, that the um, slides are not advancing for the people who are watching it over Zoom. So yeah, that's they... why Raquel's kind of running in and out, trying to okay. get some help with that. Good to know. We're sorry, people at home. This is outside of our control. It's working fine here, but we'll try to get that fixed yeah. for you. All right, so you wanna jump in? Yeah, Sasha? sure. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how important it is to meet people's needs where they are. And I see that as something as a former director and as the shared services person um, prior to joining Denise's team, um, bringing the resources to programs where they are and breaking it down into simple um, step-by-step bite-sized pieces is such a crucial part. And we, we have some tools and some resources we're gonna talk about that are related to recruitment and um, finding candidates, but then we. We also have some really great resources to talk about that soft side, the emotional and social side of onboarding a new em employee and creating a workplace culture that uh, people don't want to leave. And knowing that we're, we're battling the compensation challenge and that that's a bigger picture and a harder one to tackle, although the deep sharing, in, um, which is happening in Central Florida and other places, can move the needle on that. So, you know, first and foremost, I think we want to acknowledge and respect director's plates are overflowing more, more than they ever have been in the past. And so as shared services folks and as the people who are bringing resources to them, we, we really do want to do it in a way that um, makes it easy and simple for them to use. So we see our work at the ECE Shared Resources um, that side of the work as creating DIY tools that executive directors, owners, administrators can use, but also that coaches and TA staff can use in their work with programs. And so we're going to highlight some of those things um, in a bit. I think what I love about the ECE Shared Resources platform is that it can be available to everybody, to all providers. And there may not be places everywhere where the deeper sharing is happening. We hope and the OPEX team is helping and all of you are helping to grow that um, because that's really where we can make a vast difference. Um, but our DIY tools really are designed to, uh, again, take sometimes complex issues and make them really simple. Um, we have building blocks webinars on the platform that are one hour free, free webinars webinars that are also recorded and posted, and they are designed to focus and tackle some of the pressing challenges from an operational and a business side that are happening for programs now. Um, we are going to get into some wonderful new resources that are focused on the soft side, the social and emotional side in a bit. But now I'd actually love to have Kate talk a little bit about what we see as the do it with me, the do it for me kind of resources that um, and um, and sort of business supports that deep sharing can offer to programs. Sure. 
Um, <clears throat> so in, in Central Florida, the model that Thanks. we're uh, taking is to really no, sorry. Um, take over the entire back office operation for um, small child care providers. So on the staffing front, um, we've partnered with a local recruiting firm. Um, so that recruiting firm posts all the jobs for all of the providers in our network um, uh, through a variety of different uh, job boards. Um, they do all the screening uh, of candidates. Um, they, they do a lot of back and forth with the providers to make sure that the job uh, descriptions and the postings are accurately reflecting the, the requirements of the job. Um, also doing a lot of uh, coaching and promoting of the um, providers to to really advance the skill set. So, you know, coming into this work, we found that a lot of them were not really requiring much as far as backgrounds were concerned, you know, so we're really asking people to already before they even apply for the job, have the um, DCF, you know, required training to be able to go into the classroom right away. Um, as and have CDAs. Um, so, you know, they're getting, uh, the recruiting firm is getting to be very knowledgeable about the childcare industry and what it takes to provide quality in the classroom. So they're providing coaching around that. Um, but they do do all the job postings and then they do that first round of screening. So they're providing to the, uh, our, our members, uh, qualified candidates and going ahead and scheduling that first round of interviews. Um, so really so much of that, there's just so much time taken up in screening through all the resumes and calling the people. And so, um, so we've taken that burden off their plates. Um, and then once they have made an offer, we do the, the reference checks and the background screens um, just to make it easier for them to get a qualified candidate, you know, on the ground in the classroom. Um, the other thing that we do do is um, as Elsa we, you know, we try to promote the use of the shared resources platform. So we do, we know what's on there. And, um, you know, when it comes to um, onboarding, you know, when it comes to even the sample job descriptions to start from, we try to point them to that, that website and get, you know, take some of that burden off of them so that they aren't starting from scratch and trying to figure out how to, how to bring a candidate on and make that onboarding experience a high quality experience. So if you haven't caught the um, nuances by now, we're ECE Shared Resources. So we white label our product. We're kind of the secret sauce behind Shared Resources Florida, which is what um, Kate and Raquel use in their work with their Shared Services Alliance. Um, and across the states, the name of the platform can be different, but the resources are very much the same. And states have that ability to really customize it to become a very state-centric resource hub, as well as take advantage of all of these national tools. So um, our, our work is that DIY stuff, as we've mentioned already and Celissa touched on. Um, our typical MO is to create this toolkit, make it simple and easy for people to use, and to be able to, um, you know, do the things that maybe aren't as comfortable for them, because they are early childhood educators, they are not HR management specialists, but we have a section in the website that's all about becoming an HR manager. And so those are the resources um, and they start with job descriptions and job ads that can be completely edited, changed, but they get you about 75% of the way there. Um, they're based on best practice and best, um, you know, best supports across the industry. So they're highly relevant. Um, we have behavioral-based interview guides. One of the most challenging thing to do is to interview someone, right? Um, because you need to have good questions. So we have interview guides that has those questions and you can change them. You can delete any, use any that you want, but they really seek to understand how a person would respond in a situation or about a topic as opposed to, so how long you've been in the field? Five years. Do you like it? Yes. You know, hard, that's, it's hard, right? Um, myself included, I recently had to hire for a new position and I used one of these behavioral based <laughs> interview guides to help guide me. And you know why I did it? Because I wanted to bring equity to the process. I wanted to make sure that what I did with candidate A 
was the same as what I did for candidate B. I used it to capture my recap, and then I could really make a much better decision on the end um, on the end game. The other thing that it has in there is EEOC, the Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission guide guidelines. <laughs> what you may and may not ask a candidate. So really interesting, it's maybe three pages of questions that you may not ask about. Um, and so that's in there as well to refresh the memory of those individuals as they're going through the um, interview process. And then finally, as uh, Raquel mentioned, the phone screens and the reference checks, and it's just a little tool to help them go through that process. But our biggest claim to fame in the, the um, past few years has been Acquire for Hire, which is our job posting applicant and management service. Do we need to advance this? Denise, we're having some issues with our um, remote connectors that are not seeing the, the PowerPoint yeah. advancing. So we're trying to fix that error. Okay. What's showing on the laptop here is not what's showing on the screen. These guys so are, are saying the are correct. The slide deck. Uh, I see. They're saying the, the people in the room are seeing the correct slide. So people who are on the um, the virtual session, if you go into your Attendify app, you can download the presentation and view it right there. Um, and we can guide you through the titles of the slides if that would be helpful, so that we can continue while the technical issues are being worked out. Okay, so sorry for this um, outside of our control, but technology happens, right? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I'm going to jump into the um, real world experiences and Kate is going to talk about Elsa some more. Sure. <clears throat> so one of the um, things that we're trying to do as Elsa is take advantage of the fact that we uh, can provide um, a more um, sophisticated level of service for our providers um, by having access to not only um, market information, but um, human resource expertise. So we do offer HR services. You know, I in my past have served as a chief human resources officer in companies. Raquel is a SHRM CP. So, and we've got, um, we also have uh, a network of HR experts in the community, so that if there's a if there's if there's a question that comes up or with respect to HR law, or a particular um, you know employee situation, we can provide that guidance and get them some um, professional uh, uh, opinions on how to handle the situation. Um, in addition, um, we can do market analysis uh, to show. You know what is what are you know what are the wages in this particular industry in our specific location, um, so that the the offers that people are making are are going to you know are going to be competitive and people are going to accept those jobs. Um, and one of the things that we're also you know trying to <laughs> impress upon the providers in our uh, in our um, geography is. You know, not only what are the competitive wages with within, within the childcare industry, but what are the competitive, you know, this the past two years have just been remarkable in terms of what other industries have had to do in order to increase wages and keep staff. So, you know, it's frustrating being in this industry and knowing that people that we might want to be hiring, you know, could be working at Walmart for $15 an hour, Target for $18 an hour, but that's the reality. Um, so we just need to figure, we're trying to strategize with them to figure out ways to sweeten the pot, um, make sure that our providers are taking advantage of um, all the offerings that are available through our early learning coalition. There's, there's the teach scholarship, there's, um, you know, free training that's available, just to make sure that they, they, they're making um making the, the job and the compensation as attractive as possible. Um, we provide business coaching. Um, both Raquel and I go in and meet with the providers on a regular basis. We look at their budgets with them. Um, to, we've, we've developed a, a financial model so that we can model what's the impact of trying to bump up the wages a little bit, showing you know if you increase enrollment by just one or two children, 
what the impact is on the bottom line and how that can help you support increases in wages. And then um, by working with a uh, recruiting agency, we're actually able to share candidates across providers, which has been really nice. Um, mm -hmm. So somebody might go through the process and you know be a second or third choice for one provider, but they're a first choice for another provider. So we're trying to get some economies of scale by doing that as well. So really just providing that, um, you know, as, as Rian was mentioning in her talk earlier this morning, trying to get those economies of scale with respect to HR management um, across the providers that are in our network. Thanks, Kate. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Acquire for Hire and share a little bit more detail about how that works. Um, first of all, I experienced firsthand as I worked with childcare programs throughout New Hampshire, helping them take advantage of this tool. And I have to say, one of the most rewarding things you can do, or I f found that I can do is help directors make the, help make the job a little bit easier, help save time, and even better yet, help save money in any way possible. So um, helping them tap into Acquire for Hire has been incredibly rewarding. It, it's um, not only a sort of a self-service job posting, creating job posts and then job posting tool. Um, it's already got customized ECE positions built in. So they populate, pre-populate for you, and then it's fully customizable. So you can make it really your own and reflect the values and um, job requirements that you have. Um, the, the thing that I love about it so very much is that it automatically populates with one click to eight popular job boards, saving directors so much time. And then the other part that's wonderful is that the system pushes those job posts up. And that's something that businesses, childcare businesses have been paying a lot of money for in the past to get their jobs pushed up to the top. With our um, Acquire for Hire, all of the states that have are using that tool, they they pay for Acquire for Hire, but providers pay nothing. It's a free tool for them to use. And what I've seen in programs that I've been working with in New Hampshire in the past is that they report saving anywhere from three thousand to five thousand dollars a year or more. And one of the really wonderful wins a program shared. Um, this past fall was that they saved $1,800 the first two months. I mean, helping them save that money so that they can reinvest it in the more important things like, um, I loved what um, we heard earlier, professional compensation. I think that's um, such a great term. Anyway, so um, the other thing that's really wonderful is that the states who are providing this platform can monitor data through an administrative dashboard so they can see what the utilization is, how much engagement is there, what are the number of job views, the number of applicants that submit um, resumes, et cetera. And that's, you know, really um, something that can be helpful to monitor. And um, I also love the fact that the directors using this tool have reported better outcomes in terms of the number of candidates and the quality of the candidate. So there's a, a really nice win when you can see that happen. Um, so I wanna talk just uh, briefly about some of the other cost savings that are available through the ECE Shared Resources platform, um, because I experienced them firsthand as a director, saving thousands of dollars on things like trash removal, classroom supplies, office supplies, food, and more. Um, this is That's all money that you can reinvest in compensation and other things. It's really speaking to the scale that, um, that we, we think about when it comes to shared services. When one thing I didn't know until I joined Denise's team as I did as I took advantage of this as a director and then helping programs um, through the shared service work in New Hampshire is that these are ne nationally negotiated cost savings that are part of the company CCA Global broadly. And so when Denise mentioned the flooring division is the largest division, these discounts are negotiated with hundreds of thousands of businesses per sort of contributing to the scale. That's just something that you can't do on your own. And, um, and knowing that we have to help programs, if we can help them save precious dollars, that's incredibly rewarding and it will make a difference. Thank you, Celissa. So this is an interesting slide, right? I like pretty graphics, um, but you know what it is? Getting your ducks in, in order. Um, and if you haven't heard that, that term, it's really about um, thinking about all the details. Uh, a respected and dear colleague of mine always said, the devil is in the details. 
And, you know, what's interesting is we don't think about those details. So we're going to take a look at that. And we're going to explore kind of the policies, the procedures, the operational tools, the best practices that really do contribute to you getting your ducks in order. So preparation for recruitment. Who knew you had to prepare, right? We have an open position. We just want to hire for it. But in today's world, in today's landscape, we have to be thinking a little bit more broadly and a little bit differently. And so the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you know what your teachers actually do? And you probably say yes, right? They're a teacher. They're in the classroom. They're helping shape little minds um, and you know, helping them learn. Well, um, they may not align with the actual job. Um, and so how frequently are you validating and verifying this with your teachers? And if that's a practice that isn't happening, it's one that should, and we'll explain why in just a little bit. Um, the next thing is a salary scale, which I know is, is you know, a little contrary to what we've learned about earlier this morning, but um, within a program, if you're not hiring and using a salary scale, how can you assure that you're equitably compensating, um, or you have a candidate who's really just great and they negotiate for more salary and now you have this you know, unequitable situation where the same position, one is getting more than another, not good. Um, so we need to look at that because persuasiveness is, um, is great, but we need to be as operational managers and leaders, we have to be looking at what does that do to impact our overall bottom line. And current world pressure can actually um, create that desperation, right? We need to get someone in. We can't be without you know, someone in that key role for very long. And so sometimes you make decisions out of desperation. If I don't offer them this, they're not going to come. So what do you do, right? So that's what we're going to talk about here um, is really this um, benefits and compensation strategy, um, putting it in writing, making it concrete. And we'll show you some tools that will actually do this. And you know, can you show the real world value of the compensation and benefits pack package that you offer? And there's some things you can do there. And then your salary analysis, and I believe Kate mentioned this, is that if you're not aware of what um, other companies are doing in the way of entry level wages, they're what, $15 at Target and those kinds of, you know, bigger box organizations that you're, you could be just moving yourself right out of the market because folks are going to take a $12 an hour job when they can get 13 or 15 or even more. So you have to know what's going on in the market. And is there a way where you can balance that in some sort of um, other benefits, other um, resources and that kind of thing? We'll look at that in just a minute. All right, so let me move over. So we're going to take a look at equity and recruitment in the retention journey because there is a lot to be talked about in this. And as we said, very, very important to Gen Xers and Gen Y or millennials. And so we really have to be taking a um, taking close look on this. And Kate, you want to kick this off? Sure. Um... So from an ELSA perspective and what we're trying to do with our Shared Services Alliance in Central Florida, um, it is a very deep alliance in that we have uh, one of the requirements of participating in our alliance is that you either have to have your books uh, and accounting done by us or you have to share your monthly financials with us. And we, do, we go through a, a budget uh, modeling exercise with each of our providers on an annual basis and then on a monthly basis compare budget to actual so that we're providing them with very deep um, financial coaching. Um, one of the reasons is um, to be able to uh, be able to to have that understanding of what the cost of care is so um, so that we can be a part of the conversation and advocating um, at the state level um, for fair compensation for our providers, um, really being able to see 
um, to what extent the subsidy payments actually cover the cost of care, um, but also then able to advocate mm -hmm. for increasing wages. And as I mentioned, being able to model, you know, if you, in, in Florida, they've already passed the law that we're gonna be increasing our, our minimum wage to $15 an hour between now and 2026. So this is coming and all of our providers are gonna to have to deal with it. It got raised to $10 an hour in September of 2021, and it's gonna go up a dollar an hour from here until 2026. So, you know, when I was working with providers, um, even last year, some of them were paying, they just like, like, they're not necessarily knowledgeable about what minimum wage is. So. I would be, you know, by getting deep into their numbers with them, I could say, you know what, you owe your cook back wages because you're paying this, your cook less than minimum wage. <laughs> so they just, they need that assistance. You know, some of them have been in the industry for years and they know all the HR laws backwards and forwards, but others are just starting out and they really, they haven't, they, they're not, they're not business people. They're, early childhood educators. So they really need, what we're trying to do is level the playing field. We give everybody that business backbone um, and to be able to be professionally managed. But mostly um, by, by getting deep into the numbers and having that data, being able to advocate um, for the providers to increase their compensation and for the staff in order to increase their wages. So we're going to continue with equity in the workplace and in the way that you demonstrate it and the way that your practices um, can follow a logical process, but also be repeatable, re-implementable and relatable. So as we look at this, you notice on this slide, um, demonstrating consistency throughout the entire process through whomever you're working with is really hugely important. Um, and so what we're looking at in that little chart to the right is acquire for hire. So that's our job posting platform. And it has a workflow um, functionality. This is just a, for demonstration purposes, what you see in this slide. You can change any one of these, um, this workflow. You can add more to it. You can um, create your own. But the reality is every candidate should follow that same exact process because you want to demonstrate equity. You want to demonstrate that what you're doing is consistent. And this is one way that you can do that. We're also going to take a look at um, the salary scale and the benefits. Um, tools that we've created. And most importantly, it's a dialogue with your staff. And so it seems like they're um, unrelated topics because we're talking about recruitment on one side, but on the other side, you need to still be able to keep the people that you're working with and that are part of you know, running your tremendous organization very highly engaged. Um, and so they want to know that they're valued they want to know that the work that they do is part of a bigger picture and that it is um, a valuable contribution to the success of the organization. So those two way um, you know, conversations, whether it's a quarterly one on one or five minute you know, um, interaction in the hallway once a week. Also formalizing that annual review process. If you don't have one, we have tremendous tools for that. And then as we talked about, the assessment of the actual job versus the job description. I was recently at a legal seminar on, on the importance of detailed job descriptions. And um, who knew there is liability for, um, for businesses who don't have well-written job descriptions. One of the things that he said was, we see this coming to, um, you know, to court that the teacher wasn't asked in the job description to do X, Y, Z. And so now they have a legal leg to stand on and they can combat the employer. Well, this happened in Pennsylvania actually several years ago and it happened to do with bona fide occupational requirements. So if you're not familiar with what that is, you have things that you may not ask, right? We talked about that EEOC um, questions that you may and may not ask, but if it's a bona fide, meaning you have to have it to be able to perform your job, you can ask about it if you ask about it properly. So this happened to do with a teacher 
who had um, visual and auditory um, disabilities, but never it was never discussed in the job um, in the job description. It was never discussed during the interview process, and you know, it, it was invisible. Well, what happened was a child was injured. Um, the teacher was not able to see the child or hear the child in distress. And so she was terminated. She filed for wrongful termination, citing that it was not a requirement that she needed to see beyond a particular, um, you know, um, number of feet, nor did, did she have to hear if there was a lot going on, you know, like, you know how it is on a playground, right? <laughs> it's noisy. And so um, when there was all that background noise, she could not hear the child's cries for help. So the court ruled in her favor because the job description was not detailed enough. And um, she was, had to be reinstated with back pay at the company that had terminated her. Well, I can guarantee you they changed their job descriptions real quick. So the moral of the story, it really gets back to this, which is look at your job descriptions, talk to your teachers, make sure that they're giving you input on this because what you may learn can be surprising. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is we're doing different things especially because of COVID and in the way that we're using technology now, technology in the classroom, technology operationally, um, some of our policies and procedures have changed, which could necessitate a change to these very important job descriptions. So keep that in mind. Now we kept mentioning the salary scale um, template that we have. This is just the samples for illustrative purposes. It's not perfect, it's not meant to be. We just wanna give you an idea of how you create a, an equitable salary scale based on um, education and time in the field and position. And so we do have a template that you can use to create your own, but this is an example of, again, creating a business practice and business model that supports your financial model um, so that you're not paying someone more than what you're paying another and creating disequitable or inequitable situations in the same role. Um, and then, you know, this is what you can refer to. I'm sorry, but we have a salary scale and we implement this equitably across our organization. I'm sure you can understand that this is important to just having a workplace culture that is based on respect. And that's the conversation, right? And it's, it's easy to have if someone helps you with the words and you're using that kind of a template. So the next tool is one that um, we recently added to the platform. And what you're looking at is really kind of setting yourself apart, right? With all of the jobs that are available and everything that's out in the workplace, how do you show what your benefits and compensation package offers and you know makes you stand out from all of the rest? And so what this is, um, and it is an edit editable tool, um, is that benefits and compensation package for a teacher, okay? You can change this for any position that you want. And it starts with your regular stuff, right? Salary, paid time off, um, employee subsidized benefits that the employer may offer. And I'm gonna stop right there because one of those is so cost-effective. It is our docs by phone or telemedicine service. If you're an employer and you offer it to your childcare staff, it's $8 per staff per month. And it covers the staff and all of their legal dependents in their home um, for virtual visits for non-urgent conditions like ear infections and rashes and that kind of thing. Um, there's no copay. And you get a prescription discount card. So it reduces the costs of prescriptions. And you can also search around a radius of where you want to pick up your prescription and find the place that has the cheapest cost for that prescription. So it's a really great um, service for under $100 per employee per year. You can be offering this as a huge benefit. It does not replace major medical. 
but it is something that you that can set you apart. And so it's a very cost effective um, benefit. On the other side of the, the slide, you'll see that professional development is, is up at the top there. This is actually one long, long document. I broke it up to fit on the slide better. But um, professional development, it, according to Indeed, is one of the number one drivers of not only workforce satisfaction, but workforce retention. Um, employees want to be educated. They want to continue. They want to be more valuable. They want to, um, to grow themselves. And if you can show how you're going to do that and help them do that, right there you have quantifiable dollars and cents that you can add to for your salary, it's X amount. For your paid time off, it's worth X amount. For the docs by phone, it's worth X amount. For PD, it's X, 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 and the dollar signs, dollar signs, dollar signs, right? That is huge because that's something that comes out of their pocket otherwise. And if you're subsidizing that cost, why wouldn't you show that in dollars and cents, right? So that's um, another part of it. And then the rest of this, I'm gonna call it the real soft side of HR, but it's really important because it's how you're showing staff that they're respected, new hires that they're really desired and you want them to become part of your team. And how do you do that? With the really great orientation process. So we have a 90 day orientation process in the toolkit, right? In the ECE shared resources platform. And then it continues for and actually for another nine months, because you want to make sure that that individual has that support, has that mentor, brings them through the, um, the you know, six month, nine month and 12 month um, process. They now know that you value their, um, their place in your organization and you're helping assimilate them. So there's a whole set of tools on that, which we are delighted with. And then these are things you may be doing, but you're not putting them down anywhere. So what other things can you potentially think of that um, could be important to the individuality and the unique skills that um, a new staff person can bring? And some of the ideas here are, um, a VIP teacher mentor program. Maybe you could have them grow into that role if that's what they wanna do. Maybe you have a staff crisis or emergency fund that if there's a situation where somebody needs a little assistance, you can do that. Um, maybe you can offer a flexible work schedule. You know, in this, um, in the millennial and the Gen Y and the Gen X, they value flexibility. They may have and choose to have multiple jobs. So if you're offering a part-time job and they're job sharing, then you know maybe you're not paying all of the benefits. So you can um, you know pay better wages. So there's some thoughts on that. Um, paid planning time, a longevity bonus, and then those optional things. Can they run the family bulletin board? and keep that up to date and um, interesting? Can they be part of the welcome committee for a new family? Um, or can they be part of the workplace safety committee? And that's even a, a set of resources that is new to the platform, but many childcare programs didn't know that they're required under the laws of OSHA to have a workplace safety plan. And so there's a whole set of tools to do that. So these are the kinds of things that create and tee up our next slide, which is creating a workplace where people want to stay. So I'm going to um, talk about that a little bit. And, um, and actually, before I get into some of the um, things that you can do related to your workplace culture, I want to just mention, I mean, we have to acknowledge recruitment and retention are both harder than they've ever, ever been in our field. And, um, and some of the things related to workplace culture should actually go in a job post too, because it might help set yourself apart from um, competing, competing companies. And if the hourly rate isn't too far off, it really could tip the scale enough for someone to say, you know what, I really want, I really do care about the work environment that I'm in. And I, I think, you know, for most people, that is a really important factor that they care a lot about.
about the place they choose to work, that it really matters. And I'm really passionate about these next set of resources that we're going to share with you, because in my work as a director, um, really prioritizing workplace culture work was one of our deep, deeply held, held values. And I would say our approach to workplace culture was sort of a reflective practice approach, very similar to what we did in terms of what was going on in the classroom with children. We really put the same kind of energy and vigor into what's going to create a work environment there where people want to stay. Um, we Obviously, we have to acknowledge wages are a huge factor. Um, in the meantime, we have a lot of control over workplace culture and the things that we work on and, and how we approach that with folks. So we're, let's move to the next. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're already there. She's ahead of me. <laughs> so there really are a lot of things that sort of funnel into creating a workplace culture where people come to work and they're passionate and ready to fully engage in that job. And as I talk about some of these resources and share some of um, what you can tap into, I think, again, consider putting those things in a job post because it really could attract candidates who care a lot about where they're going to spend a huge amount of their week. So benefits and compensation, obviously key, creating a, a, a strong morale in the workplace and um, practices and strategies that show staff that you appreciate staff and that you really care about having a, a health, healthy culture. How are decisions made? How do we strategize when there are challenges? Um, how do we treat one another in the workplace? All of those are things that make a huge difference in quality of life in terms of the time you spend at your job. So I think, um, you know, these these again, these are tools that we have a lot of control over. It's really speaking to the social and emotional side of what um, helps helps create satisfy a satisfied work environment or a satisfying work environment for people. So let's go on to um, onboarding and we'll take a look at some of the tools that are on the site. Denise already mentioned that there's an employee orientation toolkit. It's so comprehensive, really a, a dense amount of um, resources, but structured in a way that's very simple and easy to use, creating checklists for what you need to prioritize the first day, the first week, the first month, and making sure that they, those things obviously include compliance related things, Department of, Sa of Labor, um, licensing regulations, etc. Um, but they are also strategies that we weave in about how do we welcome a new employee? How do we help them bond with other members of the team? You know, a new person can feel a bit like a fish out of water when they start. And I think people assimilate new information and that onboarding in different ways. Um, so finding ways to help them connect with the team so that it's, it feels socially and emotionally rewarding too can really make a difference. I know firsthand how fragile those first couple of days are and you know, getting someone to come back on the second day and come back on the second week. So some of the tools that are um, built into the platform now, um, I think we might want to go to the next slide. Um, they really are designed to focus on um, creating that culture where people want to come back day after day. So no, I'm actually going to pass the, the wand to Denise and let her talk about some of the tools related to performance coaching. So we run a series of um, webinars. They're called Business Building Blocks webinars, and they are about really operational type um, topics. And so we ran one um, called the Grow Coaching Model, and it's a wonderful way to kind of shift the, um, the control and the authority and autonomy of um, the teacher's job and role um, to them. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, it's interesting what I've seen, um, and I'm sure if any of you are employers or managing people, sometimes staff thinks you're going to solve the problem, and they don't have to have a part in that. But the reality is, we have to take that giant step backwards and say, okay, we can see this is emotionally charged. How do we take the emotion out of the moment, right? Help them articulate and focus on the facts. What are the facts? And then um, what can be done about it? What is, what is the, um, you know, what is the objective here? What is the goal? What are some potential solutions? How could you achieve that solution? What would it take to do that solution? 
This is a five, maybe 10 minute conversation at mm -hmm. most. And it really shifts the balance from you being the mediator and, you know, resolving things to um, teaching the, the teacher um, or other staff to really take control and in a very professional and um, mature way have some of those difficult conversations. So this was one of those things that you have that folly, right? First, the goal is part of it. What is the goal? What would you like to accomplish? How do you need to accomplish it? What is the reality if it's not meeting the goal? What do you need to do to adjust that reality, align that reality, change that reality? What options do you have? Um, and then what is the way forward? And it's a, it's a very simple but very powerful way to help um, really uh, create a culture that is respectful amongst staff and teaches people to not um, rely on someone else to be the, you know, the one to resolve all of those issues. So this is one of those things, but um, it's very participatory and it's a volley like you would with a child, um, you know, having a dialogue back and forth and teaching them about, you know, the, the various social emotional skills. It's the same way almost with staff. Um, and so, you know, there are personalities, there are generational differences and all of those kinds of things that you'd be dealing with. And this is a proven model that has been very helpful. So this is just one side of that, um, you know, softer side of HR. And I'm sure, you know, as the work that Kate is doing, um, these are the kinds of things that you hear about, that there's, there's tension. Um, and I think there's even more tension now with the challenges of working through pandemic and a terrible virus and the concern over that and how do you address it? And, you know, you don't have to recreate the wheel and you don't have to go it alone. You have shared resources, you had shared services, and it does pull those things all together. One of the things we're doing at ELSA um, is, you know, in addition to having a very active role in the finding and hiring staff, we've initiated a retention model where the recruiter um, reaches out and has a very specific script at 30, 60, and 90 days, uh, just doing check-ins with each of the staff that's been hired. A lot of times um, people might share with an outsider something mm -hmm. that they wouldn't necessarily come in and bring up voluntarily. So it's a nice way to have like just an independent check in um, and provide some feedback uh, so that the director can address maybe some issues that have, you know, before before somebody takes action and decides to leave or just starts to maybe, you know, start some rumors or grumbling or whatever, um, just provide, we're, we're testing this as a model to see if we can help with keeping staff longer and also just, you know, helping improve that workplace culture. If there's some things that are happening that maybe aren't necessarily making it to the director's office. Um, so that's another thing that we're giving it, um, trying in, in the test capacity right now. Oh, I think that's wonderful and you know very interesting. And I think these new resources, actually these have been out for a little while, but they could be really helpful in dealing with some of those, I'll call them prickly situations and prickly staff. Um, and so Celissa so is gonna share a little more on our healthy workplace culture tools. Um, and again, this is all part of that recruitment, retention and engagement journey. And so it doesn't stop once the staff is in-house, it continues throughout. And the way as an organization that you address the, the whole organization in terms of culture and values, but also the individual in terms of their culture, their values, their inclusiveness, the diversity and the equity um, and pulling that together, it's not easy. And we don't pretend to make it easy. And you're going to be dealing with situations that are prickly and uncomfortable. And I think we all know there's always that one staff person who's going to throw the wrench in the works and ask that question that is going to derail the meeting. And they're going to go down a dark hole and it isn't going to be pretty. So now <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, but that's what this this tool and this set of resources is all about. So I'll let Solicitor chat about that. 
<laughs> so, so thinking about that, because I experienced that plenty of times, I always felt like as a director, I'd rather have that come up and know about it instead of having it going on behind my back and not knowing about it. That, that you know, there's no opportunity to address it and kind of draw it out. And I think these, these um, tools that I'm going to talk about next, they really are designed to help. Um, so we call them leadership essentials. There's a um, healthy workplace survey on there, and it's really designed to give staff a voice and to try to draw out the things and really understand and learn what they care most about. And um, some of the things obviously will be harder or maybe even impossible to change. You can't change the licensing regulations, although in some states, um, licensing is really open to navigating that and brainstorming that a bit with providers. But um, what, what you can do is create a culture where the team, the, the staff, the members of the team are involved. Um, I'm a firm believer, and there's um, actually a sample, sort of a template for how to conduct staff meetings where you draw some of these things out, like what are the most rewarding things about the work and what are the things that are helping you get your job done? And then what are the things that are the most challenging? Um, what do we need to, and then brainstorm and work on together how you find solutions. So, you know, it really speaks actually to what some of the top drivers are of workplace culture that um, statistics have shown that it's opportunity to learn and grow. It's belonging, having a sense of belonging and being part of something. It's organizational values that align with your own, if at all possible. Um, that certainly contributed, in my experience, to people staying for a really long time. And then support for well-being, which really can include the emotional side of things. And I think um, the docs by phone, which Denise mentioned, there's also a teletherapy portion of that. I mean, emotional well-being is strained to the max these days with what we've been through the last couple years. And then collaboration is also um, statistically shown to be a top driver of workplace culture. In my mind, I feel like that also Inclu should include participatory, participatory decision making whenever you can. Um, certainly, you know, there, there are certain things that a director and owner has to decide. Um, and if we sort of take the same practice that we do with children and talk about why, that can make a really big difference um, with staff understanding and accepting decisions. But I think whenever possible, involving staff in the decision making and, um, and sort of, I, I love, again, the same approach with children. You talk about the why, you get into, well, if we did this, here are the challenges that come up and how could we work around them? And if we did this over here, here are the challenges. And so, again, the tools can help you facilitate that process with the team so that it feels like um, a real sort of um, cohesive and strong team. And it's not relying on the director to figure out all those things and hope that it's um, working for what staff care most about. It's really a way to build investment. Um, so the next set of tools I'm going to talk just really briefly on. These are can the I, newest. Yeah, I, go ahead. Um, yeah, sure. Add something to that. So this um, part of this workplace um, culture thing is a survey, right? Asking staff how they feel about various topics about your organization. And the key thing is the survey, once it's completed, does not just go in your drawer. The survey needs to be analyzed and then you need to figure out how am I going to talk about these things with staff? Um, because they wanna know, they filled this out um, and you may learn some things that are a little eye-opening and they may be sensitive topics, but you really have to talk about them. And this is where you get back to that prickly person who's going to throw the wrench in the work. So you have a staff meeting, you're going to talk about those <coughs> results from the survey, and they're going to be the ones that say, I know this, that, or the other thing, because I'm the one that wrote that down. Uh, okay, then, well, thank you so much. And we are you know, going to take that um, and, and talk about that. But they can really have a, a voice that can really um, shift this from the positive, um, the positive tool that you're trying to incorporate, right? So one of the things that I've had to do, believe it or not, it is shocking and is that I've had a couple um, of instances where someone was very vocal on, on a very large meeting, was very negative, very demonstrative that what I was doing was 100% incorrect. The only person on this very large call that was saying that. And, and I, I tested the waters and asked. And 
that person would not let it go. So I had to say something on this very large call. And my, my conversation went like this. So-and-so, I can see that you have some very strong feelings about this. And I would love to explore that with you offline so that we can continue the discussion on the greater part of this. I value what you have to think about and, and talk about and offer on this topic. And so it has not fallen on deaf ears, but let's take this conversation offline and have that conversation privately. And then we can figure out together what a path forward might be. That shifts the whole balance of power. It shifts the whole conversation and it allows you to take back control. So when you have that prickly person, and we all do, that's one of the things that you can do that treats them respectfully, honors their concerns, and then tries to find a path forward. So let me move on, Salissa, to the next section. So we have some new new resources that are again designed to help really dig into that workplace culture piece. Um, the newest section, boosting morale, and then we actually just published last week, beating burnout, with similar tools. So there, the first thing is sort of a guide for what you should know, um, what you should think about, and then here are some things that you can do. And I love the fact that um, you know it's really focused on helping very busy, very overloaded directors think about what they can do in five minutes. And you know some of the tips that we suggest, some of the ideas really can be implemented in five, five minutes without any financial investment at all. And then if someone has a little bit more time and a little bit of money, here are four ideas that, um, that you can do to take it a little bit further. And then there are ideas if somebody really wants to go all out, maybe they have some stabilization money that they can invest in um, something related to um, just the emotional well-being of their team. And so they want to do something big. So um, it's really a range. And then the other thing that we really try to include and have in this section too is you don't have to go it alone. Maybe there are members of your team that would really love to get involved in helping to shape um, how to boost morale and how to um, beat burnout and how to build fun into the work so that it's not just about the compensation, um, which we need to continue to work on as a country um, and through deeper shared services to free up those dollars to invest more in um, professional salaries. Um, but there are things that you can do that really do make a difference with the culture. You know, it's so true. Um, this afternoon, our, a colleague of ours, Lisa Polk, situation where she had to uh, make some really big decisions. I'm not going to steal her thunder, but here's one of the things she did, um, which was to take her leadership role as an executive director and decentralize um, the authority to um, a team that really um, spread the responsibilities. And it freed her up to do other things. Um, it got her out of a sticky situation, but she's going to tell all about that fabulous story. But the reason I bring it up here is Celissa said you might have some champions and staff yeah. that want to and would love to lead this. If you're having those quick, you know, dialogues um, and two-way communications on a regular basis, you might find out more about what makes them tick. What special skills do they have? There's always one or two that shine that you know are the real cheerleaders in your company, right? In your business. And what can they be doing that they might want to do and take over for you? And that's a type of a leadership um, opportunity because you need all kinds of people, right? You need all kinds of foods on the buffet to make it an interesting buffet and a fun party. Um, and that's what we try to do with these resources and the work that we do. It's like, it's the, the grand buffet. If you're a vegan, we have these resources. <laughs> if you're a meat eater, we have these resources, but it's pick and choose what works for you. It's not all or nothing. It's here's this, or here's that what works for your organization. And it's the same thing with what Kate is doing. It's that flexibility to meet people where they're at and address what they need, bring them the supports that you, know, you can offer to them to help in the moment they need it. They might want you to do it for them, um, but they might want you to do it with them because they want to progress into that next level. They want to be able to make those um, educated decisions on their, on their own at some point, but they want the support. 
because it's not an area they feel real confident in. And, you know, Raquel is um, a certified, uh, it's a Society of Human Resource Management Certified Professional. I believe that's the acronym. Mm -hmm. um, that takes time, energy, mm -hmm. commitment. And God knows childcare leaders do not have more of that time. They are motivated. They have the energy. They have the commitment. But they don't have the time. And they can't do it all. And that's why the work of the Shared Services Alliance, the work of our DIY model, you know, mashed up together are really strong supports for shared services in a localized way. So I'm going to move on to the last slide and we're going to open it up for dialogue and questions and, you know, want to make sure invite you all to um, participate. Um, I'm going to kick this off and I'm going to hand it over to our friends here from uh, Florida that what we just talked about is not a one size fits all solution. There are none. There are none. And I can guarantee as a woman, you go out and try that one size fits all pair of leggings. It's not working, you know? <laughs> um, and so it's, it, that is what we are dealing with in the field that you have to be able to be flexible, to be expandable, to contract and to adjust and align based upon the needs in your local communities. That's what shared services is all about. So uh, would you like to take the next two pieces of this? I think that's where your, your real skills and specialties are. Sure. You know, in, in Florida, we're in a pilot year. So a lot of what we're doing is experimentation. And a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out what the providers really need. Um, and it's interesting because um, we have Karen here as well, who works at our Early Learning Coalition in Orange County. And she's been hired specifically to promote the, um, the Florida uh, version of um, the ECE. Acquired prior. Yeah. Well, no, just the, the whole, whole thing, the whole yeah. platform. Yeah. Shared yeah. resources. So, so she's working on the ground and, and make, you know, and sort of promoting the do it, your, do it yourself using this tool that the county has invested in. Um, and then Raquel and I are, are running a much more do it for you kind of model. And we're just, you know, trying to figure out what works best because there's all, all different flavors of providers in our community. There are people that are just starting out. There are people that have been in business for 20 years. Um, but everyone's kind of, you know, everyone's got some of the same issues, but different levels of ability to respond and um, take care of it themselves so it's just nice to have that partnership within our in our um, community and um, exploring the different approaches um, there was a question actually that came in Denise um, about sure. as you guys have been describing the tools that are available on the site I know in different states there's different ways to access the site while it's a it's a common backbone <laughs> platform Mm -hmm. It is um, privately labeled for each of the different sites. So mm -hmm. somebody who is wants to know how do I access this for my state? What are your kind of generic? Um, what what's your you generic response to? Yeah, how do, how do I find this? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So you can find um, whether your state has one of these platforms by going to ecesharedresources.com. And on that platform, you'll be able to see who our state partners are. And you can click on a link and find out who it is and you can contact them directly. You'll also see the URL for that state's particular site and you can request access. So it's as simple as that. Um, hope you can find it. You know, just look under state partners. And I can put it on the chat, the link to the ECE. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, let's, let's start here. Uh, I, I was just wondering. I, I was just, I'm just going to say it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering uh, what kind of recruitment team do that we couldn't do ourselves, uh, like as shared services coaches or coordinators? Are there specialties within? Field of workforce development and recruitment that made that piece in Florida crucial for you. I mean, where it's first of all, uh, we I knew of a recruiting firm that was interested in in partnering with us, um, just as kind of a community give back uh, um, initiative. So that made it easy and. 
we just decided because it was the number one issue that all of the providers were struggling with, we just decided to put some significant resources on that um, on that um, initiative. So it was, you know, as I mentioned, we're in experimentation mode. So it was not necessarily that um, I knew for sure that it would work better than um, a provider doing it themselves, but I just knew that um, I had a solution that I wanted to try. Um, so what types of things are they doing? the recruiting firm. Mm -hmm. So they've got their own uh, applicant tracking system. So it, it's not dissimilar to the acquire for hire platform. Um, but they're, they're doing recruiting across all over all industries. So there's just, they've got, you know, experienced recruiters who they follow scripts and do, they do all the interviews. Um, so it's really, I mean, there's no secret sauce necessarily. It's just getting that whole responsibility off the backs of the directors so that they're not having to spend their time. I mean, you know what it's like, you know, when you're, you know, on site at a facility, it's just, you just move from one crisis to the next. So when is it that people are actually checking to see, you know, who's applied and wading through all the resumes of the, of, you know, the, you know, 90% of people who apply who actually aren't qualified, you know, so to get to that 10% that are, and then figuring out the time to schedule the interviews with them because you're either being pulled into the classroom or you're out running and buying the groceries or you're, dealing with a parent who's having a fit about something, you know? So it's really just understanding that it's just one more thing that gets done after hours because you're fully engaged during the six o'clock to six o'clock, you know, <laughs> sure. hours that most directors are typically working, so. And, and for me, working with, with the providers is kind of identifying the level of support that they need. And some do need more of that hands off. OK, we'll take it over because we have um, the, the capability of a designated person that's focusing on that throughout the day. That's their full time job. And then you have other programs that do have the in-house resources, a person that can manage that, that and dedicate the necessary time as Kate mentioned, to, to, to do the full on from a job description development all the way to tracking and, <laughs> and managing that applicant process to, to hire. So again, it's a case by case, but the beauty of it is that you have that do it yourself with the tools that you need to move the process and not be stuck in one thing for hours, creating a job description, for example, or I'm in a position where I have to completely hand it over and let them provide me qualified applicants that I can interview and move, move along the process. Denise, there was a question that came in. Um, Ohio already has the shared resources platform. They were asking, are the re resources that you guys have been sharing today, are they available through the Ohio platform? Yes, they absolutely are. They're on Early Learning Resources Ohio, also lovingly known as ELRO, which <laughs> we love, uh, but they're all there. Mm -hmm. They're in the uh, Becoming an HR Manager section of your website, and you can get there by just clicking on the featured um, topics right on the homepage. Question here. Um, this question is for Raquel and Kate. And so we've been talking about the one side of the service um, for educators and owners. And I was wondering on the childcare business side, we've been doing a lot of onboarding of coaches to prepare them to go out. And so I'm wondering if um, you have shared resources on your onboarding process for the business coaches um, because we've had to develop a lot in Washington on our own. And so just wondering, that'd be great to be able to share. And I'm happy to share a little that we've got started so far. Oh, that would be amazing. So we're just in our pilot year. I mean, and I was very, very lucky to uh, be able to hire Raquel, who had been in the same role that I had been in, in um, or, you know, organizing and administering a whole business institute. So she has a very similar background to me and that she, you know, has traditional business background, but also has been that kind of been living in the early childhood space for the last several years. To be honest with you, I'm not sure where we're going to go in terms of finding more and training up more childcare business coaches. So that's something I'd love to collaborate with you on. 
Okay, thank you. And, and one other thing, and this is outside of the ELSA, but I know in the state of Florida, um, the Division of Early Learning is piloting a coach model um, for the ELCs to participate at this stage is on a voluntary basis, but there is a model out there. So I suggest that you reach out to the Division of Early Learning in the state of Florida. And I'm pretty sure that they'll be, you know, they'll be open to sharing what, what, they're, what they're looking at. But it is kind of that development of a business coach to go out and, and support the, the programs. I have been texting my people everything you guys have been saying word for word. And we just have like a question. So like our state is not ready to move in this sort of way. And we know that, um, but we're hopeful that like within our region that we can like light the fire and then hopefully it'll turn into a flame. What my question is, is like, what, like, what is the smallest group of providers that you've worked with? And like, how have you seen that scale? Um, and then like, if the state is not um, sort of absorbing these costs, like what, like what does this actually cost? And you know, for for us to get something like this going, that like the providers can buy into at a low rate, or maybe that we can match it with a funder or something. Um, but we don't have the state. What state are you from? Missouri. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I like how you say, okay, um, but I live there. I've been in early childhood for, you know, 25 years there. And we've seen, you know, we're seeing more progress with our governor and their new office of early childhood, but we've got a lot of, I mean, it's going to take a while to turn the ship. So we're starting regionally in St. Louis. And that's why we're here today because we've got um, the support of our, our, our mayors and things like that. Um, awesome. So. Awesome. Well, so I'm, I'm giving a presentation tomorrow on um, writing a business plan for a shared services uh, alliance. Um, and that was where I started in kind of costing out what each of these services would uh, uh, cost to provide. Um, and really the next step is then, you know, just circulating your plan and going, every, you know, knocking on doors to figure out who's interested in funding. Um, your alliance. So in so we're in a pilot year, and um, the funding has just come through private fundraising. Um, so some foundation grants. Um, we are going to be able to get some state funding um, that's starting as soon as we get the contract signed. But uh, <laughs> we're still that's still being penned. So, you know, I, I think step one is to write the business plan and to do just, you know, just by looking up, you know, figuring out how much does it cost to do marketing services, you know, just come up with a dollar an hour rate and, you know, how much does it cost to hire a childcare business coach? And then, you know, if you're um, just circulating that plan with anyone you can think of that might be able to put you in touch with somebody who might be interested in, in helping you launch it. Um, and I would recommend connecting with your local chamber of commerce. They're well connected with businesses locally. Okay. So when you start circulating that you're trying to bring this model that supports an industry, the success of the workforce, the rising workforce, you get their attention. So because they do have a platform and access to private businesses that could, you know, potentially be funders for, for this initiative, I would say that start circulating with, with those, um, Chamber of Commons. Yeah, and you know, we've been talking to, oh, go ahead. Around like the scale of it. So like, so like what's the smallest group of providers you can work with because we're, we're in a city. So like it's not a statewide initiative. Right, right. We're, we've just started with 10. Okay. Um, 10 seemed like a reasonable number to be able to, you know, get some decent data on, um, but also, you know, be a reasonable number that we could manage. Um, it's really just the two of us with some outside vendors that are then providing some of the other services um, uh, until we sort of get to scale and it makes sense to bring, you know, the recruiting person in-house to work for us and the accounting services in-house and the marketing and enrollment management in-house. So we're, we're outsourcing that to vendors until we have the scale, but that'll be in years two and three. Okay. 
I just want to add to that um, in Missouri, you do have the show me resource platform. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So you have all this offsite stuff and, and more um, tangible tools as well. But um, I think, you know, from your perspective, it's, you never doubt the, um, the role of a, a small group of committed people. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, changing the world. And indeed, they're the only ones that ever have. So it is, it is not unlikely to have a very small alliance. And to get that external funding, you may even because you're building capacity, and it's a shared service, you may qualify for some of that, that stabilization money or CCDF money. And they'll take a risk because they have to spend the money. Yeah. And if they don't spend the money, there's a problem. Um, you know, there's a bigger problem, <laughs> right? So keep that in mind. That might be an opportunity as well. But, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get the state to release those purse strings a little. But, um, you know, obviously you have a good idea and, you know, I wish you well with it. My question is specifically around the coaching services and the, you know, the alliance that you all have right now. Are you charging any kind of fee to the providers to be a part of that alliance? Um, so uh, Pennsylvania has a has the platform, which is for Pennsylvania, and um, we currently are offering it to providers free, and the AYC is funding that right now. Um, and we talked about uh, some kind of business coaching plan. There's another group doing that. Um, but I'm wondering, are you charging a fee or are you strictly funding it and giving it away? So in year one, we decided to not charge for it. And the reason is, is because we are in a pilot year and I'm, you know, I'm very open with the providers who have joined that this is a year of experimentation. Um, and I want to be able, because I have access to their financials, um, my goal is to be able to provide data at the end of year one that demonstrates what the impact of being a part of ELSA has had on the providers. Um, so that, but I, you know, in my business plan, I've shown that after year one, that there would be a fee that would be paid. Um, but that it would pay for itself. Um, so, but we're still in the midst of being able to kind of prove that case. I just didn't feel comfortable charging in year one when I wasn't, I mean, I, all this whole shared services idea is a really nice theory. I wanna prove on the ground that it works before I start charging people for it. Okay, and I have a, a part B. The part B is, um, is, is this PowerPoint available to those of us who have platforms on the ground to go out and talk to our providers about this piece? Yes, um, you can download it from the Attendify app. Okay. So it is, everybody right, has it. I was it. just asking your permission to go ahead and carry it out. Share it. Yes, else. please do. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad it's helpful to you. And I think we're at time. I'm happy to stay a few more minutes if you want to um, chat with us additionally, but the session is supposed to end at 1130 and we're just at about that time. So thank you all. For those of you in the back who did not get a pad folio, there are some pad folios up in the front. Please feel free to, to um, grab one of those before you leave. And if, um, if you don't get one, stop by our table.